It's December the 18th, 2021, and you're listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Here we go. Last episode of the year. Yep, I'm sorry to say it is the last episode of the year because the holidays are upon. Are we sorry to see this year go? <laughs> <laughs> That's a completely different question. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm starting to get into the holiday spirit. It was all I could do not to sing along or, or beat the drum machine on our little intro there. You know, it's like, you know, it's it's a good time of I've, year. I've right? got my little, my little Christmas lights up back here. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I don't have anything Christmassy in my study. Sorry. We got I don't know, yeah. man. I'm speaking to you from the uh, global center of Om- <laughs> Omicron from, in from, New a, York from, City. Uh, from an undisclosed location. <laughs> um, and in Imar, New York, and, this is... And Imar is missing. She uh, she has a Christmas tree behind her. I'm pretty sure right now. Um, there's work and stuff going on. So this is not going to be a very festive episode, but I think I think we have an interesting. We can make it so. Well, yeah, we'll we'll work on that. I'll I think we have an interesting topic that we want to nerd out about. It's a bit on the ner- nerdy side for sure. Um, on the sciencey side, on the um, on the high highest possible tech kind of side, which um, yeah, I've been following this and and uh, for for years pretty much. We're talking about miniaturization of optics. We're talking about what they call meta lenses, and we have we've talked about this here before. Um, you might remember them, kind of flat lenses that. Yeah, instead yeah. of instead of being glass that is curved in some way, they put little nano size posts on it, pretty much like little cylinders on it that act like antennas for light for the wavelengths of light, and they bend it and do stuff with it. And um, and so far, when when I looked at this kind of a development, I mean, of course, wishing for flatter lenses because lenses are heavy, so you better have a have a. a you could improve something there. And uh, the problem was always that they had one wavelength, like infrared, they got it to work in some useless, for us photographically, kind of useless wavelength. And here's a paper that just recently came out that completely changes everything. Um, it's in nature. And it's not just flat optics, it's nano optics. We're talking about uh, cameras that are well. Here's this is is very very nerdy. So we'll put the link in the show notes. You can read along if if that interests you. But we're talking about cameras the size of grains of salt, including yeah. the very, sensor very and the lens. <laughs> very easy to so lose. So here, here <laughs> if, if 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 you happen to be watching this on our video channel. Um, there's a there's a figure in the in the paper that shows us okay what 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 are we looking at here the right top that's a fruit bowl of sorts with bananas and apples on it that's the ground truth that is the fo- the photo that's what your smartphone would take if it, if it took a photo and then the one right next to it which looks fairly similar it's not perfect but very very similar pretty good though pretty that good that comes from yeah. a camera that is the size of a grain of salt and it's a 720 by 720 pixel color photo and then the ones on the left that are older methods and older things isn't that yeah this is wild this is pretty dazzling has anybody made an array of these lenses to uh, <laughs> up the Stitching of these. <laughs> I I think we're looking at um at lab scale. Uh, so, let's see, I'm doing it again. I have to fix this one day. Um, the 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 this is lab scale. I don't think they have really glued more than a couple of them together. I guess I don't know. I have no idea. But this is wild. Oh, we're we're not hearing you, Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah's oh, gone. Austin. Well, I tell you what. While Jeremiah fixes his audio, um, I think does it say just above those pictures that you're sharing there in in this uh, in this article, this paper, seven twenty pixels by seven twenty pixels. Yeah. So uh, I think that's yeah, that's that's not far from. I mean, I know it's less than a megapixel and stuff like yeah. that. But considering but the do size, do you remember but... the first the first digital cameras with their VGA resolution, which is below this? Uh, I, I, I do. I never, never played with one. I think the first one I had did about four megapixels, but only yeah. two of those were real and the rest of them were extrapolated or something like that yeah. anyway. But, and that was about around the year 2000 or something like that. So, uh-huh. so that was when I got my first digital camera. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, it's astonishing. Look at that. Look, I mean, the, 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 the imagery that, they're making with this camera. Yes, you're back, Jeremiah. Oh, yeah, back, oh. Jeremiah. Good stuff. The imagery that they're making with this camera is is probably not far off. I mean, what a, a, what a phone a camera would have taken fifteen years ago. Let's say. Let's look at let's look at uh, potential uses for these kind of things. Preferably because it's the, it's the Christmas time. Preferably not. With 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 too with not too much dystopia built in, right? So, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to the multicam NORAD Santa Tracker next year. I mean, we're giving him a year to get it into production, <laughs> right? But I love I love the Santa Tracker from NORAD. I don't know if either of you guys ever yes. watch it, but it's like it's fantastic. I remember a couple of years ago we were in in uh, a Centre Parks uh, on uh, for for Christmas, and they had it up on all the big screens in Centre Parks. They had Where Is Santa Just Now, you know, and stuff like that. So. I, I, I'm I looking forward to sticking a few of these on Santa's sleigh and getting a multicam feed from that. There we go. There's a, there's a, a special mission for, for the people of NORAD. I mean, uh, I mean, oh, you know what I, you know what I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm looking forward to using an array of these in anthills, uh, in bullet time. Oh, bullet so, time, anthill bullet time. <laughs> Anthill bullet time. Awesome. That's, that's the that's the filmmaker <laughs> I mean, speaking. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that is an interesting use of very small cameras. You know, like those African bush cameras that they set out and the animals come up to the right. lens and sniff around and yeah, yeah. all of that. And you see them. In, you could do this with very very tiny a objects on the molecular level of seeing how things are shifting and shaping. Certainly in space, there must be some very interesting particle photography um, and, and uh, also for uh, nature. And like I said, you could you can put a thousand grains of salt around a little hive and have I, the bullet time. I think it would be very fun. I was, I was thinking uh, uh, medical applications. I mean, just imagine instead of getting uh, a tube uh, shoved down your throat, they go, here, uh, eat, eat a spoon of this, of, eat a Honey. Sp- spoon of sugar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then, and then the, it ends up taking pictures of all your intestines and everything, and then it comes out at the Oh, other you mean end. a practical, a practical use? An actual practical cameras. use, oh. yes. Now, I, 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 I don't think these size uh, cameras will, will uh, that does not include any transmission equipment. So we're probably still looking at some additional bulk there. But um, just imagine, yeah. Just you imagine. mean like the USB cable? <laughs> yeah, that would be a bit <laughs> uncomfortable, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, instead, instead of having a camera bag, you will then have a camera shaker because... Yeah, yeah, I was thinking this doesn't bode well for the future of the camera bag industry, does it? If <laughs> or, or camera straps, the <laughs> camera straps. Well, try try think... try to attach one of those to a tripod. That would be <laughs> difficult. <laughs> no, there's yeah. there's all sorts of fun but things. I, you know, Chris, I think you hit something. Uh, the the not only swallow but surgically implant. Uh, these cameras, as long as they're transmissible, uh, to see the growth or shrinkage of tumors without uh, subjugating a little, to a MRIs little surveillance tumor, sur- visual tumor surveillance built in and stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
definitely could be good for sports as well right so you could have concussion protocols you could you could have uh cameras embedded into the balls and the bats and and the other equipment you know like um, because you see uh yeah you know how they do with the tennis these days and they have yeah it's all uh, all of these cameras all around and they have the systems that can plot the 3d uh, or cricket i'm guessing neither of you watch cricket (laughs) but they do do the same they they do the same thing if you see do you know what i mean for the tennis though they do on the major tennis championships these days where a point is called and it's contentious and they don't know whether it was in or out and they can plot through space the 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 flight of the tennis ball in yeah, 3d just, just show put exactly some of those that. cameras inside the ball and yeah exactly and uh, yeah exactly and and the bat as well you know let's say let's say let's go for baseball right you right know what you know i'll what? move away from cricket but for New- baseball you could put a a camera in the back, a camera in the ball, you'd be great. <laughs> sure. And then you, and you then make people nauseous make... when they're watching the footage. Yeah, okay. Here's a question for you, Chris. In the paper that you read, um, is it possible to embed these in sheets of panes of glass that are so small they don't really affect the transmission much of light through so that shop windows – um, can basically be recording. <laughs> yeah, there we are. We're, we're getting closer to the utopian, to the dystopian side. Watch this out. is this is Blade Blade Runner and yeah. and Minority Report all rolled into one at this point, isn't it? Yeah. As long as it's used for good. Yeah. But I mean, I, I'm actually I'm quite serious. There, there would be a very very interesting approach to. I don't know, even mirrors, um, uh, interactive, just on uh, advertising, lots of things that, that can be very, very uh, interesting, especially if you're recording through the lenses and projecting that very image through the glass. In other words, I'm talking about an art project or an advertising project or interactive project right. that uses both an invisible camera that's projected into reality. So if you look in one direction, you'll see nothing. If you look in another, you'll see an image. And, and it, in a way, that could be good for gaming. It could be good for eyeglasses. It, you know, um, for example, eyeglasses sharpening. Not oh, sharpening, contact not lenses. You, you can integrate that yeah. into a contact lens. Yeah. Sure. Um, how about DJI? They D, DJI might not like that because you won't need drones anymore. You just take a handful of these and go. <sighs> And then <laughs> they're flying. And then oh, no, they still need tiny gimbals, little, though, tiny yeah, little the fun kites on them, right? Tiny little tiny sails, little <laughs> tiny little sails, like, like a plant, you know, like something that might be on a plant. And then they will just hover with the wind and do um, do data collection over the ocean. So that'd be good. What's that, what's the, what's that movie? That's another movie, isn't it? Um, it's got Helen Hunt in it. What's it called? Come on, what's the tornado movie? Oh. Twister. Yeah. Twister, yeah, is the movie. That was a good movie. I mean, I mean, it, it <laughs> reminds me of the of the of the rubber ducks. Have you heard of the rubber ducks? That's years and years ago. There was this big container ship yeah. coming from, I think, from China to Europe, and uh, they they yeah. capsized, or, or before they capsized, they had to throw a whole bunch of containers overboard, and uh, yeah, one of them I contained tens and tens of thousands of orange yellow, yellow rubber ducks. And they ended up in the ocean and they ended up swimming. And scientists have been using them ever since to track ocean currents and these kind of things. So right? Yeah, they found them all over the world. Yeah, exactly. And they they could really tra- trace back where they came from because they know, knew exactly where that container was dumped into the water. Even so, rubber yeah. ducks migrate. Is that what you're saying? Yes, they <laughs> That's do. What we're saying, yes, they yeah. do. So hey, you could, yeah, definitely yeah. you could use tiny cameras of that sort of thing because it, it, it's all the things it's like the, the things i'm thinking of all the things you'd like to take photographs of like wildlife and sport and stuff like that you could put the camera on the wildlife or on the ball and the bat and, and other things like that and and yeah and with it, that, that, that with that size camera cool. you could you could attach a camera to to a spider to an ant to whatever you want because that wouldn't really bother them at that size of course you will still need recording equipment all, all that stuff but that's just a matter of time. So yeah, and also undersea cables, all of these things integrating uh, optical cameras or nano cameras into the construction 
of of optic fiber. We are we are getting just for, for closer. Breakage. We're no, get, no. getting closer to photographic archaeology, where you have like a a, a a visual record of everything, every time, everywhere. This is we are going in that direction. The yes. world is becoming completely digitized, yes. and um, you know, uh, I, I think that that you know, understanding the digitization yep. of basically everything in a exponential way, whether it's robotics, work, financing, uh, you know, all of that. The only thing we're not really uh, good at is um, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Right. Um, not yet. <laughs> we're working on that. Um, the interesting thing, by the way, from a technical point of view, is that the, the, the lens is not projecting... Uh, a pic picture onto the sensor as you would expect it to be. It's not like replacing the lens, but the combination of that lens or meta lens with the sensor and machine learning is how this works. So they have a machine learning thing in the back end that pretty much turns whatever garbled thing comes in into an actual picture. And that's the that's computational photography at its finest. So, so that's that's interesting. Does that mean it's making it up then? Well, the result looks fairly similar to the original. So, is it made up? I mean, that's a good question. There's a few yeah. examples here. There's a here's a here's a chameleon. Here's a blue flower. There, there well, wait a second. Doesn't that mean that all photography is made up? Oh, we're going there again. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. In other words, what's the difference between? So that's a, that. Is, that's a good question. Uh, um, that 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 is a good question, Jeremiah. I think probably what I would say is that if you have a straight processing without any machine learning, you're you're effectively yes, you are baking in what it looks like. But because you don't have that flexibility, you need to bake it in to be broadly speaking as realistic as possible. Otherwise, you wouldn't. I beg to any, differ. You wouldn't sell any differ. product. You wouldn't say you wouldn't. Say, well, okay, well, maybe. I mean, people say talk about you know talk about the 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 way lenses render and and how color science works in cameras and yeah, stuff like well, that. So so yes, yeah, so there is all of that, but that's going to be consistent, isn't it? It's going to be the same thing every time. And if somebody's mean, if somebody's uh, straight too far away from from an acceptable output in 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 making a product, they wouldn't sell any of that product. Well, how about two things I'm going to say about that. Number one, black and white photography. Yeah, yeah. The only the only reason that we um, look at a black and white photograph and and understand it as a representation of a real moment is because we are trained and used to it. There's nothing about it. A still image caught in time with no color is something that is very divorced from our reality. So that's number right. Two, okay, but number two, more important. Everybody sees differently. The way we, our eyes are not cameras. Our brains interpret the light going through them, hitting our optic nerve, back to the brain, assessing what it looks like. I mean, we could be in the matrix. We don't know what's real. We know what we are used to. We know if we run hard into a wall, it will probably hurt. But so what if you bought a camera? But what if you bought a camera, okay, and you used it for six months, and the way it interpreted images six months down the road was significantly different? The output you got when you made a shot was significantly different from what you did when you bought it. Um, or you got a firmware upgrade, um, and yeah, uh, and and that then created a step change. Um, I mean, that might be. I mean, that's feasible today because sometimes you get firmware upgrades for Fuji cameras that give you a new film simulation. So that's that's yeah, that happens already. But what if it just learnt on its own? And what if you bought two cameras and you used them for different things, and they learnt different patterns, and they started? You, you could then, in six months' time, take the same shot with both cameras and get two different results. That's very well yeah. possible. So, yes. so let me let me let me tell you let me tell you a story because a because thing? the way we are looking at pictures is we are using a neural network. This is the thing in our brains, um, and uh, here here's a story that uh, goes back probably thirty years. Um, I had my I, I had issues concentrating, and the reason was because my eyes wanted to go cross-eyed, but I didn't let them. Right, it was I was exerting force, and that made me made it hard for me. It it used it used a, a significant amount of force, and 
The only way to fix that was to uh, to do an operation to shorten some of the muscles around the eye and, and, and pretty much straighten out the eyes. But in order to go there, they had to first relax the whole mechanism. How do you relax eyes that have been uh, pulling on those muscles for 20 years? You put prism glasses on them. So those were glasses that would allow me to look into the glasses cross-eyed and look out straight in the front right so they would bend the light path now if you're a photographer you will know what happens if you look through a prism it will upside down and back to front no not that not that it's it's just a bit a bit of a bending of the light but what it did is it created chromatic aberrations right so every every uh, contrast boundary had a red and a red and a blue fringe Right, so and those were quite quite pronounced. I had to wear these glasses for about half a year, so that was a lengthy process. Wow! And I saw these chromatic aberrations every day. I put those things on, and uh, after about and and I, I put these glasses on first thing in the morning, took them off last thing at night, and at one point, four weeks in, roughly four weeks in, those chromatic aberrations were gone overnight. They were yeah. they disappeared. Yeah, and your brain filtered them out. Well, it didn't filter them out. Well, it did filter them out. It inverted them and added them back to the picture because when I took those glasses off after that, I saw inverted chromatic aberrations. <laughs> they, oh. My brain was doing that work. It had learned. It had adapted the, the neural network to do that. And uh, and then at, at the end, again, uh, the, when everything was relaxed, they did the operation and everything was fine. But having... Having been through that myself, I mean, you you read or hear about these experiments of people wearing glasses that put everything upside down, and then at one mm. point the brain turns them around, and it's like, yeah, sure. But at the moment you 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 go through that yourself, your brain actively modifies what you see. You notice how how supple that whole thing up there is, and how adaptive it is. So neural networks will will adapt and will do things, and that. What yeah. these guys are doing with these flat lenses or these metal lenses, um, I think, is not that far away from what the brain is doing. I think sure. uh, it's really interesting. I think we have talked several times, though, on this podcast about the danger of training your your uh, your learning capable machine in the in the wrong way, or even with data sets oh, yeah. that have unconscious That's, bias in them. There's always know, uh, there's always that 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 possibility when you employ machine learning. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I work in, in my professional life. I work with yeah with software, uh, and I work you know I have colleagues who build machine learning models and and things like that. You know, right. and uh, it is um, and it's it's fascinating stuff, um, uh, and it is hugely sophisticated. But it's also very much in its infancy. Oh yes, um, uh, and yeah, there, there's there's a long way to go. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, having said that, actually, you know, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna teach uh, a grain of salt to to to, to form a, an image, I suppose how how else are you going to do it? <laughs> At this point, I've got a picture of Zoolander in my head going, what's that, a school for ants? Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky, uh, but yeah, it's inter- interesting. I, I, I haven't, I, I, part of this yeah. is that I think I haven't thought about the, the, the use of machine learning in cameras too, too much. No, before. you have, because you talked about LiDAR a lot, and you've used LiDAR a lot, and that, if anything, is machine learning in terms of, um, you know, expressing an understanding of how light or, you know, waves bounce off objects to, you know, reemerge as as an image put together. That that's machine learning. In, in mm, a, yeah. Okay. Fair way. point. Fair point. Yeah. Thank you, you know? for the correction. Um, mm. I I think you know whenever there is a breakthrough like this, there is always the laws of unintended consequences. You know, we've talked about that a lot, um, both on the utopian side and the dystopian side and so you never know uh where it's going so are we um what do you think when are we going to be ready to buy cameras by the i don't know by the spoon or by the pound (laughs) by the pound i'd like half a cup of cameras please yes (laughs) yes. Uh, yeah i think it's i think we're a while away at least a decade before it becomes even professionally available 
at high I, price. I, I, think, I think as many things, it will not just be there one day. It will slowly It'll sneak merge, yeah. its, way in, its way in and we will, we will not even notice that that's coming more and more. Yeah. And, you know, we, where do we see these things being trialed? I mean, we see, yeah, there are some camera companies that are definitely trying to, trying to push the boundaries, aren't they? Uh, that, you know, uh, yeah, you could say maybe Rico on the, on the 360 front, right. Uh, are pushing boundaries. You could say that, you know, clearly you could say that phone manufacturers are trying to push the boundaries with the extra sensors that they put in their phone, um, car manufacturers, and I just I won't mention the one car manufacturer because lots of them are doing it now, um, you know, to try to to make better use of, of imagery and things like that. So the, these are some of the places where you get the innovative, innovative engineering, you know, the D out of your R and D. This is research, isn't it? What we're looking at here. This is yes. the R think, from your R and D. Yes, uh, yes. Who's going to who's going to do the D? Medical pharmaceutical. Yeah, medical. I, I, definitely. That's what I believe. Definitely. I um, mean, there's a reason that you know. Even pill cameras that have been around for 10 years, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. there's still not a, we can't go into our local pharmacy and buy one, swallow it, have it move through, and then sync our iPhones and like go, oh, <laughs> there it is, send it to the pictures to our doctors. That's not available to us yet. And they've been around for a long time. So it's going to be a while before the shrinkage. And what happens when these cameras are, quote, under attack by body acids, what, you know, all of those kinds of things, what has to happen. But I do think that what Chris indicated initially, medical use of these things is probably going to push the uh, the envelope here because I think it is a very significant use of the technology to be able to photograph the inside of a body in the smallest possible way to see things safely um, just in terms of nodes, tumors, growths, or health. And if you need you an I mean? ENT, uh, if you need an ENT procedure, you'll you'll not swallow them. You go, and then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, how about that? So um, let's move on to our picks of the week. Jeremiah, you got a new action camera. I do. I have a new camera. It was um, kind of inspired by um, some of the special effects stuff that we are doing on the show I'm working on. And, um, you know, it used to be that when you, you know, when you would do plates and um, multiple effects stuff without going into the weeds, they would photograph a silver ball and a gray ball, a gray ball to kind of assess the, um, the color temperature and the silver ball to indicate all of the reflected light in right. as much uh, area as possible. Now um, they are using these cameras, so I got to play with one on the set. I was very impressed. And so um, I bought it. I'm still learning so that's about the, it. So that's it the Insta360 One X2, which is a 360-degree uh, camera that levels yes. out and and does yeah. like all the cool stuff yeah now there's one thing that they don't really mention in the um you know in all of the kind of uh information on on the site i found the try just trying to get a pdf manual is almost impossible <laughs> could not find a manual that went through everything you have to go and it tells you one thing a little video on basics a little video right. on the on the uh, menus etc this camera with the right accessories, and I bought the whole accessory pack, which includes a lens cover, important, they're easily scratched, but a selfie pole uh, that you see running around, which, it, which the software eliminates, but also attached to that is a little handle, which acts as a small tripod if you need it, that enables you to do bullet time. So ah. you attach the oh, camera. Oh, is that the thing you where you it swing around. it around? That's right. Ah. And it stitches it all together. And it that's really what sold me on this. So, so it's it's so it's inspired. it's not like like the real bullet time where you'd have a whole bunch of cameras firing at the same time, but it is doing high speed recording while you swing it around, which is very, very that's similar right. looking. And every shot is 360. And then it's stitched together and you can adjust the frame rate, how many pictures in 
all of this. Again, I, ha I have the gear. Uh, I was going to play with it this week, but I'm not. <laughs> um, um, but I do have the camera with me to learn. Um, so I'm, I'm very impressed with this. And uh, it, the resolution is really, really good. You can shoot it in 150 degree angle, like a super panoramic, right. or 360. And, um, and it's tiny. It you know, fits in a small pocket. So uh, I'm super impressed by this camera so far. And you and, and you I'll, said I'll that a few and you said that it's it's actually used in in professional productions to capture like light spheres and that kind of stuff that you would use for special yeah. effects later on. Wow. Yeah, if you're shooting a plate, you just take a couple of pictures on the set and it just give you all the light conditions, yeah. all the all the activity. Which is super helpful if you if you want to if you want to do like uh, uh, CG later on and add it to the shot you have Matching the light you that, know yeah. the lights and the colors and exactly. everything awesome. so and now you know i've seen uh, rigs with uh, that are basically spheres of leds where you can actually control the exact match based on interpolating the right. image from where it was shot and it then paste the subject into the location with absolutely pitch perfect um lighting match so awesome. th there's a lot of good uses for it but uh, i'm interested in exploring it artistically and seeing what happens when i push it well i'm looking forward to seeing stuff from you um and then adrian you chose something i want to piggyback on top of that because i'm you'll uh, be most welcome sir <laughs> okay what did you bring us i just wanted to say good luck to everybody involved in the launch of the James Webb telescope. Oh, so yeah, as, yeah. as, as, as this particular podcast goes out, uh, assume it goes out on the Wednesday, I think we'll be two days ahead of, of the launch, uh, which I think is, is currently scheduled for Christmas Eve. Yes. So, you know, it's been what, 30 years in the making, <laughs> you know, I think they must've started it as soon as they got yes. Hubble up, basically. Uh, Absolutely. They, they went, well, what should we do now? Let's do, no, what, what, what should we do next? <laughs> so um, it's interestingly enough, uh, Hubble is more on the visual light side and uh, the James Webb is, uh, is uh, mainly infrared. So it looks further out into the universe than Hubble ever could. And it's, it's, it's more, more modern. It has more modern sensors, much more sensitive to light or to whatever bit of infrared is out there. So it, it's going to be giving us some mind-blowing results. Take, we'll take, yeah, a, we'll say, take half a year after it comes up because it's a bit of an origami thing. It's folded up in wild ways and uh, the mirrors are unfolding over weeks and months, I guess. And the whole thing will take quite a while about half a year until they can start shooting with it well they'll have to calibrate it all one day they'll have lots yes. and lots of tests to yes. do and, and stuff like that but getting I, the pictures back from the lab is going to take a long time but um <laughs> they, they do they do say that that it will start to investigate the 94 percent of the universe that we know absolutely nothing about yeah. which is very exciting I mean, we should we should probably do an uh, early next year an entire episode on this because it really is a, a marvel for for just one little example. And um, they are also looking at signatures of life on other planets, and the way they do this is we're talking planets that are so far away that they don't really have. I mean, the camera doesn't have the resolution, or the telescope doesn't have the resolution to really look and see the see the see the Martians up there. But what it can do is. If a planet crosses in front of the star that it rotates around, then it its atmosphere will slightly filter. Just I mean, it's tiny in, in in relation to the sun, but it will filter the light that comes from that sun or from that star um, just a little bit, and it will very very minutely change the the wavelengths of light that come back. And this way they can deduct if there's, for example, CO2 in the atmosphere or something. And also, uh, you know, it's pointed at basically the the Big Bang. I mean, that, that's the, the, the intention of the web yeah. is to photograph deep into the past. 
Billions oh, they, they and hundreds of billions of years back. Yeah, they want they want to go back. All, within Ten a, billion years. W- I think I think thirteen billion years, and they want to go back yeah. uh, within a couple of hundred million years of the Big Bang, or something like that. I mean, which is amazing. It's amazing that everything we see when we look up, we are seeing the past. Oh yes, we are oh, seeing yeah. light. Yeah, and and. It's hard to remember that, but when we look up at the stars, we are actually looking at, you know, years and years and years, millions and billions of years yeah. uh, that it took that light to reach our eyes. That's pretty um, mind blowing stuff. Anyway, let's wrap this up. I think. I think well, happy new year, everybody! What, what a mind bender of an episode! Happy new year, everyone! <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, it's been a year. It's been quite a year. <laughs> <laughs> Would not recommend. <laughs> yeah. Actually, for me, I had a good year. I had a very good year, so I can't complain. So, there you go. Yeah, the, it was it was okay. It was okay, mostly. Let's look for more exciting things in 2022, shall we? Oh, yes. There will. I think excitement is pretty much guaranteed. That's. I, I can promise <laughs> yeah, I you that. Good, excitement I meant the good is, kind. <laughs> no, no. Well, let's let's just leave it neutral. Excitement is excitement. Anyway, okay, cool. everyone, thanks for being around. We'll be back next year. Until then, bye bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to the future of photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 